Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for another book discussion with the Unerased Book Club. The book that we are discussing tonight is No No Boy by John Okada. And we all have different covers of the book, but this is the one that I have. Um, and before we get started, just briefly to introduce ourselves. I'm Lucy and I am a library tech at Ann Arbor District Library in the youth department. I do youth programs and adult programs both. I am a white female with shoulder length brown hair and green glasses and uh, watercolors behind me. Hello, I'm Christopher. I'm also a library tech at, at the Ann Arbor District Library and I tell stories. I'm a uh, white man with glasses and short hair and a blue shirt and I have a pale yellow background behind me. And my name is Jacob. I work in the outreach department at Ann Arbor District Library. I am a 28 year old white male with a beard and I'm blonde and I'm sitting in front of a white wall and a yellow Ikea lamp. Hi folks, I'm Fatima. I am a facilitator for the Unerased Book Club where we read and build community around Asian American authors and their writing. Um, I am a South Asian woman and I have a digital background from Chittagong, Bangladesh of a balcony with this lovely bougainvilleas and uh, crows. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited to be discussing this book with you all where we've read No No Boy, which uh, to quickly summarize is the story of um, a man, a young man who, uh, who refused to go to war uh, during World War II um, and uh, was and then in prison for a couple of years. He, and uh, this is his return to society and reintegration into society and his journey into that. So um, as we like to start all of our Unerased Book Club discussions, um, just wanted to know what folks' impressions and first thoughts were about this book. Um, well, I thought it was, uh, it was kind of, it was sad. Um, and I was surprised by how much conflict and turmoil there was in it. And I had heard of the term, no, no boy. And I'm familiar with the two questions on the um, loyalty questionnaire, but I just didn't realize that to answer both of those questions, no, um, is, was to really divide yourself and be pulled apart and and um so it just was like filled with this kind of this feeling of turmoil and um i i was just it was very sad yeah and the historical things i learned from this book were things that i learned completely new to me i had never heard that term before uh, no no boy uh, before i hadn't even considered I haven't even considered being a no-no boy as um, something that was possible. Um, so there's a lot of learning, historical learning there for me. Um, the characters itself, there was, I felt so many different ways reading this book. Happy, frustrated, angry. Um, at some points I was, I felt like, I don't wanna hang out with these people anymore. <laughs> but I learned so much from them. It's complicated. I'll stop rambling. <laughs> I really, really liked the book a lot. I thought the writing was so enjoyable. I really liked the characters. Uh, I thought that it was much more subtle than I expected. I, ex I thought there'd just be a monolithic view that war is bad and I mean, that's there obviously, but I, I just thought it would be just hitting us over the head with a very straightforward view of uh, one culture and one person's reaction to that. So I was so delighted to, to get into all of this. Um, nobody is really happy, I don't think in this book, mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't bother me. I, I enjoyed that too. Um, 
I just want to thank you for bringing us another wonderful book to read and discuss. And, you know, I, I always tell Lucy that it's so nice to have a book that is outside your normal reading and that you get to enjoy. So thanks. Thank you so Sorry. much. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for our listeners who may be unfamiliar with the loyalty questionnaires or what happened, um, Japanese Americans um, who were in American concentration camps uh, in the 1940s were required to fill out a loyalty questionnaire. And it had two specific questions. Are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? And Will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organizations? And this posed a identity crisis for a lot of Japanese Americans, especially those who were born in America, but still uh, uh, were incarcerated during that time. Um, and so some of them replied no to both questions and were severely um, punished as a result of it, whether uh, further incarcerated in prisons or, um, or and or uh, ostracized by other Japanese Americans and everyone else. So for me, um, what took me by surprise in this book was that I really also anticipated like a singular point of view of this character, but I was really impressed with how this is almost like a anthropological account of that particular time and space. And it captured the perspectives of so many different uh, types of Japanese Americans who were living there. So whether someone who served in, in the war and, you know, was really proud of it, someone who served and did not like the end results, you know, someone who didn't serve, someone who's thinking about serving um, the older generation and the younger generation as well. I just really felt like it was a good record of that time. And I felt transported into, into that time period, which um, I wasn't quite expecting. It took me a little while to get used to the way sp people spoke, but um, but I really appreciated that there were so many different um, perspectives, often told in like a first person point of view in the form of thoughts. So really appreciated that. Um, so there's a lot of things to dive into in this book. Was there anything particularly striking um, that folks wanted to start with? I agree. I think there is so much to talk about with this book. When I was reading it, and I read it very quickly because it was a quick read for me, um, I thought, you know, I'm getting a perspective on another person's life that's not my own. But at the same time in this book, I was able to reflect personally and relate so much uh, to what's happening now. And I thought that's a great piece of literature right there. So you get this other perspective, something that is very different from my background and my upbringing, uh, you know, being, being Japanese in Seattle at this time, but so much was very contemporary. You know, just to name one thing that struck me very clearly was mom's madness and her mm -hmm. delusion and her steadfast refusal to look at reality. And I thought that was very interesting. That's not, you know, my main point, but I, I was really struck with that, so. You know, I would agree with the, um, like the, the way that it reads extremely relevant for today too, and that there are some things I think in this book that just haven't changed. There's this line that I, he, he says, it's not an easy thing to discover suddenly that being American is a terribly incomplete thing if one's face is not white and one's parents are Japanese in the country of, of the country of Japan, which attacked America, but that if one's face is not white and it just like mm -hmm. combined with 
other people being, you know, wrongly imprisoned in this country just for coming into it. And it just it it um to see that in this book that was written, you know, in the forties, and it was just um yeah, I I, I agree, Christopher, that. You, I was learning so much about a particular time in history, but I also could see how it related to today. Right. I think the writing itself, all those run-on sentences where he's expressing an idea and that idea unravels and he's able, the author's able to show us, you know, kind of all the different facets and the complex emotions that the character is feeling about that, he could feel hopeful about something and feel joyful from that hope. And then in that same sentence express his justified anger and then discuss what's the point of that anger and what should I do? And that's true to, I think, how people process things. And I, I, reading, especially speaking about those run-on sentences, I was like, this book is expressing uh, a universal truth about people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really cool. But then I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I had issues with the book. I had issues yeah. with the book. <laughs> I wanna hear about those issues. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do. I, the, the, the point of view of Ichiro was so, um, layered and you could see the kaleidoscope of his mind all these different things pinging around but when it came to characters like emmy or the mom that was just very much like she's mad or with emmy it was like i don't know why they love each other they never had a conversation like they she just instantly became an object of his not even desire but it's just like y'all should go get coffee or talk <laughs> to each other I don't know why you feel this way about each other because there's nothing there so that I, I was frustrated by that mostly because the mind of Ichiro and, and other characters in the book were so incredibly artfully all the different things going on were expressed in such an, an, an amazing clear but creative way but that wasn't reserved for the women characters in the book and I was like ah oh, too easy <laughs> I, don't, yeah, I, don't know if I, I read her I read a review that was like this is very much a man's book and I wouldn't say it's a man's book but I do think that it is a book of male characters and mm -hmm. the thoughts of male characters and there are women in it but like as you said Jacob they're not I mean one of them it just descends into complete madness although she's representing a viewpoint that i had no idea was even a thought you know yeah. Um, yep. yeah i would have to agree with that i think that the using woman as props or female characters as props is a sign of the times in a lot of ways and uh, um and they were very much like uh in service to the male characters you know in whatever shape or form um so so uh, that that was frustrating for me as well but I think um if I took it for everything else that it is I um I can overlook that and uh, and for me it was like the the question of like these questions keep coming back you know what does it mean to be American what does it mean to be a person of color in America and be an American who is a person of color as well. And I just keep thinking back to uh, the beginning of the pandemic when there was um, a lot of a hate against AAPIs, a lot of violence against it, Asian Americans. And I remember uh, Andrew Yang in the Washington Post, you know, writing that op-ed piece talking about how people needed to show their Americanness um, in, in and demonstrate uh, solidarity or like patriot patriotism by wearing you know red white and blue and some other things that, um, and I remember feeling so frustrated by that because I don't think that that would have really um, done very much to because people would still see 
the physical characteristics of a person of color and determine their Americanness in that. And I feel like we are still content, contending with that question of who gets to be American um, every single day, especially um, especially today. Yeah. And this book very much deals with that question. I kept wondering if I had missed something quickly as I was reading the book mm -hmm. about exactly why he answered no, no. And I think it becomes a little bit clearer towards the end and it becomes a little bit more overt. Um, but I really loved the fact that the reader is not sure why. And, you know, maybe Ichiro isn't totally sure why either. And so I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it as well. The, the ambiguity being played out with that questionnaire. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that second question in and of itself is very um, full of ambiguity and it's tricky because if you say yes, mm -hmm. then you're saying that you had allegiance to the emperor of Japan, even though you're American. Mm -hmm. So to say no is, you know, it's just, it was, it was a, it seems like a trick, you know? And I think I, I read in um, this other book that people were answering no, yes. So they didn't have mm -hmm. to serve. And then like, it's not, I don't know if it was universal, but like at least the book I was reading was at the Topaz um, concentration camp. They changed it and you had to answer the same thing for both questions. Mm -hmm. So it's like, actually, we just really want you also to go fight our war. but. Um, but it, I think the complexity of those, the, the questions posed for the people who had to answer them, this book, I, like you're saying, Christopher, because we didn't really, we couldn't understand exactly why he answered the questions that were going to cause such turmoil for him. It, how do you answer those questions, you know? Right. Yeah. I don't think he knew how much turmoil it was going to cause him. And I almost feel like when he returned, because he had so many regrets, he lost all connection to the person he was who said no to those questions. He was just like a completely different person, unable to deal with the realities of, of having, having done that, having been incarcerated for two years and having to reintegrate into a society that seemed to value your veteran status more than anything else. Um, as as proof of your Americanness, yeah. And um, even before his imprisonment, his family was in the camps. Yes. Something about the book that I found to be fascinating was that that looms over everything, mm -hmm. and is never really talked about. Yeah. Maybe did I miss it? I don't think I missed it. I don't, I don't think the emotional impact is talked about. It's almost like people are like, I'm just going to try to keep going and rebuild as opposed to really delving into what the trauma of it. Um, and I was reading in an article that um, with this book specifically, the reception was so poor that the book went out of print originally. And it was because people did not want to be reminded, Japanese Americans specifically were really against this book because they did not want to be reminded of that time and of the choices and, and all of that. And it almost was like shining a light on something that people just wanted to move past. Um, and, and I think the book is also reflective of that, even though he does, the author does spend time talking about um, what are like the, both the racist, the xenophobic, as well as like the economic reasons why, why the internment happened in the first place, right? That people lost their businesses, the businesses were defaced with the, you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, broken into, defaced, uh, um, as well as just uh, um, having to sell their material goods for a fraction of their value and things of that nature. Yeah, in a way it was a land grab. <laughs> some of them, you know, some of it was described as like they had a million dollar farming business and, 
than to come back to nothing. Yeah. Aggressive. Um, I am. This book did remind, make me think. Like, has anyone ever considered uh, enrolling in the armed forces? I never did, and my brother, who is a very unlikely person to be in the army, but he just wanted to play music. He tried out for the the band, I think mm -hmm. the army band, and it was a, not a good fit, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it is, it is not something I've considered and reflecting on that, like, my father's father was in World War II. And he never once kind of was like, you know, join the armed forces. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't even any sort of conversation about it at all. Um, you know, maybe I did consider it because I thought free college, but then I was like, not my little daffodil soul. I don't, I don't think it's for me. <laughs> I but shout that. out to all the veterans and people in the armed forces. We love you. Yeah. 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 yeah my father was in the army, um, right out of college and, uh, talked about it a lot. It's like a lot of stories. It was right, uh, during the Vietnam war, but for like a couple serendipitous reasons every time his group of people got called up something would happen like he needed surgery or he you know it um so that he didn't have to experience that and I've really heard so many stories about the um the like the experience of living with all those people and the jobs that you had and the day-to-day -day life that was very interesting um but I was, it, it was never something that I considered for myself. And I know like when my son was um, in, in the middle of high school, he sort of was talking about it. And I think like, I just have to, you know, um, nod my head, but as a mother, <laughs> as a parent uh, at this time, you know, that's, it was for me, not a good thought. Yeah. I, um, I was in JRTC for most of high school. And, uh, you know, I was, it, to us, uh, having gone to Detroit public schools, um, to us, it was pitched as a way to get a college education, like a free college education. And so um, I considered it to be that. For, um, and, you know, in a serendipitous sort of way, I didn't have to take that option because I was able to, I had other options for funding my education. But for a little while there, I very seriously considered that. And I know that a lot of folks who served um, in World War II benefited from like the GI Bill. And that also comes into this story of uh, people returning to school because of the GI Bill um, and, uh, and having a chance to move through that. Um, one of the other questions that we had was like, you know, there's a, this book is a result of policy, right? The American policy changes. Uh, and uh, I'm curious if, you know, any policy changes in the, uh, that you, that we've had um, impacted the way you feel about yourself here in the U.S.? And, and our identities as Americans. Well, I mean, it's kind of a big one, but Roe v. Wade, uh, like, I think that that minimize, that decision minimizes the identity of anyone. I mean, anyone who, you know, it identifies as female that, or it, it minimizes a lot of identities, but mm -hmm. that would be a big change that comes to mind. Uh, hell yeah. Um, I, my answer is kind of funny because 
I, I think something that was huge that happened for the LGBTQ community is gay marriage in America. Um, but at the time it felt kind of bittersweet for me because I was one of my best friends at the time had gone through conversion therapy mm -hmm. and it felt like, oh, it's wonderful that we can all get married. But I just felt really odd that the first thing on the docket wasn't getting rid of conversion therapy. So it felt like complicated and that, those are two policies that were made me feel bittersweet and uh, still kind of have unresolved feelings about all of that. And I, then I think about the, was it North Carolina or South Carolina who threw the biggest stink about um, trans people using restrooms? It's a few it, places. It, it just, <laughs> what'd you say? It's a few places that threw a big stink. Yeah, back. sure. It yeah. sure is. Yeah. And, um, not that I'm trans, but what it communicated to the community at large was just like, on a government level, like, we don't really care about you guys. And it's a really weird feeling to, um, even in a small way that I felt it, to hear that from on, 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 a, on a governmental level. Yeah. I think what I find interesting and that relates to both of the things you've mentioned and trans issues and the book is that often there's an argument put up, well, we can't do that because of this. You know, we, we need, we have to have, um, we have to have low taxes for trickle down theory. And there's an argument there that to some people might even seem reasonable. We can't have gay marriage because gay people will wreck the institution of marriage and they'll do it willy nilly and it'll just be a big joke. You know, so there's an argument put up and then you realize it really is a smoke screen. Whether people know it or not, it's really a a way because you simply disagree with the issue at hand. And I think that relates to the book as well. You know, uh, well, we can't have all these people running around because they'll sabotage the country. Well, will they? You know? Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm just a skeptic when it comes to these sorts of arguments that get proposed, I think. Um, and they're always, they're always being proposed. Some people think it's because this is the last gasp of uh, very entrenched thinking. And I don't know. Mm. I think it's kind of a way it's it's always seemed to me like all of these you know things it's a way to allow people to um express their hatred without having to to express their hatred and that's right uh you know it's just i mean it's about power and money and racism but i really think it just like it, it seems like it just boils down to people being like i'm allowed to hate this group of people or um but I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that with these words, with those words. Right. And do, and do you think, I guess my question is like, do you think that it changes, it changes um, how you feel about, like how you call yourself an American, right? I think one of the big questions that this book contends with is, is like, am I American enough or am I American at all? Um, and so... When I think about these issues, I definitely, I mean, I feel very strongly in one direction or the other. I'm absolutely impacted by, by the policy changes and everything else, just like a lot of other folks are. Um, but I don't know that it's ever made me, it made me question my Americanness. If anything, it made me more staunchly like argue that I know I am American. <laughs> like I know that deep within myself on how I am and how I think that um, I'm very American and I'm, I'm reluctant to part 
with that identity or even like have anyone else deny that I that identity for me or deny me that identity rather yeah and then this makes me reflect on when Trump was first elected how many times did you hear we're moving to Canada and it's like whew, that is a wonderful idea, but you'll be a big old American sitting up in Canada. Um, <laughs> so, so it's not to repeat what you had just said, but it's about what yeah. makes us American. What does it mean to be an, an American, but not feel American? And I think that this book tackles it in a very literal way, tackles yeah. it. A lovely, lovely question to ponder. Um, so this is actually perhaps the oldest book that we've read, something that was published much earlier than our other selections. And I'm curious about like your impressions of that compared to some of the other contemporary literatures we've read or the intergenerational fiction that we've observed in other, other books or uh, that we've read. Um, how are how are these conversations you know the same or how are they different i'm just curious as to folks thinking around that well one thing i was struck with in in all the books that i think i've read for unerased book club is this idea of immigration just comes up over and over and it's, it's usually the same idea of conflict. Who am I and where do I belong? And I feel like that has been a continuous theme in all the books I've read for this book club. So I don't think that has changed that much. And, you know, um, someone's identity and who they view themselves as is really a fundamental part of of that identity and i i guess i didn't realize that until now that for better or worse your your kind of nationality i guess is really a part of your identity mm -hmm. you know and everything that comes with that you know maybe Maybe I shouldn't call it nationality. Maybe it's really more of a cultural identity. I, I'm not sure, but that's a huge part of who you are. One thing I was really taken aback by, and I think that feels different than some of the other intergenerational stories we've read is the way that Ichiro talks to his parents. And like, it's almost, it's so rude and violent in, in a lot of ways and it's offensive. And I'm trying to, I was trying to recall like so any of the other pieces that we read that, uh, that was similar. And I couldn't because there's even, even when like characters were angry with, with their parents or upset with their parents and they were trying to like navigate, you know, cultural differences, they tended to stay quite polite or respectful and he was not that I was actually just shocked by that this book was angry which I loved it is so wonderful at least for me to see anger expressed yeah I'm angry <laughs> we're all a little bit angry it's just wonderful to see anger expressed in this way with that being said, that's what made me fall in love with the book. And that's what made me be critical of the book. Like I'm thinking about the way that he talks to his parents, um, the unending anger, albeit justified, mm -hmm. was as freeing as it was frustrating, which is like just a really interesting notion. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Jacob, I thought that uh, his anger and his emotions were kind of woven into the new characters that kept coming into his life. So 
I, I, I appreciate what you're saying because at first I thought, oh boy, this is going to be kind of a one note book. Mm -hmm. But then you get that beautiful, beautiful, sad chapter with, uh, with Kenji and his father. Oh my yes. God. Also, it was fascinating from just a writing standpoint because it had nothing to do really with Ichiro's journey as the main character in the book. It was a chapter wholly separated and devoted to Kenji and his father. And uh, so touching. Their relationship. Ooh. Mm -hmm. That's that's a, that's that's what I got. Their relationship. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was actually just like a complete um, foil to, mm -hmm. you know, the way that Ichiro related to his parents, the mm -hmm. vitriol that he just kind of spat at them, you know, and um, and the way that his mother felt about him, essentially, like, if you had answered yes, I would be dead, you know, like those kind of saying those kind of things. And so that I feel like Kenji's chapter was, was just this reprieve from that and also this very moving story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the juxtaposition of like Kenji's father being proud of him brought them closer, but Ichiro's mother being proud of him just drove them apart um, and the decisions around that. Like I thought that those were interesting parallels. Oh, that's it. That is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Could I ask an open-ended question? Um, why didn't Ichiro take the job in Portland in your, in your view? <laughs> and I don't know that I have any- Yeah, I, I wonder. It just felt like such a shame-driven, like internalized shame. Like he mm. Yeah, almost like he didn't it. deserve it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, shame in wrapped up in self-sabotage mm -hmm. wrapped up in shame mm -hmm. and also fear mm -hmm. he was afraid of taking this giant step in his life so he said you know what i need to figure out stuff at home before i do anything big like this and it's like figuring out like taking the job would actually be the action of figuring out what to do with your life I was, I don't know, uh, I was heartbroken. I wanted to throw the book, but then <laughs> he came home and everything resolved itself. Mm. And it's so weird to say that because how everything resolved itself was with the suicide of his mother. Yeah. And I'm like, man, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and maybe he realized, like, I do think he, it was, there was feeling of like, I don't deserve this because I'm, I'm horrible because I answered the wrong thing and I did the wrong thing. Um, maybe there was a realization of like, I'm still gonna hate myself in Portland. So like, I have to go home and figure out how not to hate myself. I don't know, <laughs> which yeah. he somehow did. Like you're saying, Jacob, especially, you know, when his mother killed herself and he and his father both were like, ah. There was a line in the book where he, he I, I can't remember exactly where, but he talks about how, how you carry the internal stuff with you no matter where you go. And so it's just a, a, like him running away to a different location will not be him running away from the pain and the truth of himself. And I thought that was like, oh, that hit really hard. And and I feel like this book did that, like every now and again, there would be like this little like moral messaging that I, or or little truth bombs um, scattered throughout. And, and I was like, oof, okay. He had like, uh, Okada, he had some opinions about things. <laughs> yeah. You know, I thought it was interesting when he was like always kind of, 
mulling over those those moral issues or like the why this is this is that there was this circular language in his thoughts about because I'm American but like or she was born she's Japanese of the country Japan and like this like the repeating of America and Japan and America like all in the same sentence and it um seemed a little strange at first I guess but then I think if is such a good indication of like how those things are just kind of coiled together for for the people in this book um like that was just sort of his rambling thought process but he would just keep going with the you know um of like you know japanese of japan or like he just was very specific of the um the identity and then of the place yeah. I, I in that circular notion, like I, I'm so glad that he actually spent time deconstructing some of the racism that is in the book, and I was really happy to see that because there were definitely instances of anti-blackness. There's instances of just like other like anti-Chinese sentiments, um, and a few other things, and the way that he kind of unpack that and kind of pointed out very explicitly how problematic and wrong that was I, I appreciated that and I thought that was quite um, advanced for a book of that time period yeah oh yeah I found the quote um, on page 112 it's he says I won't be running away. I'll be getting away from them in here, but I won't really be running away because the thing that's inside of me is going along and always will be where it is. It's just that I've got to do things right. And in order for things to be right, I've got to be in a new place, new people. And I thought that was just like, you can't run away from yourself, but you still have to go somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you had a, a question um, on, on your website. One of the guided yeah. questions is about incarceration and like the different places you see incarceration. And one of the things I thought, which I think relates to that is that sort of being incarcerated, like imprisoned within, within yourself and mm -hmm. in your, your mind. And, in, um, and I think definitely for each year or that he just feels like he never got out of, of prison because he's going to live in this prison forever because of the decision he made. And so I think that relates to what you're, what, what you're saying and what he's saying is like, even yeah. if I go to this place, I'm still in my mind, I'm still incarcerated in a way. Yeah. And visible. And, yeah. and everyone seems to know just walking down the street that I was a no-no boy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't, don't you get that sense that it's, you know, it's like a scarlet letter or something that it just, it's evident to everyone, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems and it, like there's some sometimes it's like the like in the restaurant where he goes um in Portland and the the, the uh, server is wearing um the veteran pin. And so it's like other people are wearing a physical symbol and he's not. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the missing leg that people can see the wounded soldier who's returned or you know, an actual veteran pin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I thought so much about the difficulties of reintegrating into society after you've been incarcerated. Um, and that's been on my mind because that is a problem that we still very much contend with where there are so many laws around employment around education and just a variety of things where you have to explain time if you've been incarcerated um, and explain yourself and the things that you're able to receive um, and I just I I felt that in this book really heavily um, that part of his trouble with reintegration is because he was taken out of society for so long and that interview scene near the end of the book, uh, the, at the place where Gary works, the the Christian something society I don't recall, 
where the interviewer, I believe, says, you know, Gary has a problem. And suddenly Ichiro, Ich, uh, um, Ichiro says realizes what the interviewer is getting at and mm -hmm. realizing that he has the same problem I wasn't even following quickly enough to know what was going on mm -hmm. but yeah um, you know and, and all of the interviews you know where he realizes how futile it is because everyone is going to ask what, how can you account for the last several years, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I wonder if there, as we come close to the top of the hour, I wanted to see if folks had um, any last thoughts around this book or things that we weren't, didn't have a chance to cover. This is, I'm not gonna say this right, <laughs> but like, That's here okay. I go. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. The bane of my existence when I was a teacher was teaching Catcher in the Rye. Mm. Because it's this very singular viewpoint in which you learn so much about the world. So like investing in this singular viewpoint allows you to see important things about history society, so on and so on. I just don't like the guy. <laughs> it, it, you know, but I can still appreciate it mm -hmm. and understand its importance. And there's still so much value there. And there's a reason why that book is taught. And there's a reason why this book is important. Well, there's a hundred reasons why this book is important. But the, the feeling was, well, just maybe I don't have to like the guy. Maybe that's not the point. Yeah. But it's just, it, it, teaching Catcher in the Rye was like, you have to hang out with this kind of gnarly dude asking students to do that. And I was like, I don't like this, but it has value. And mm -hmm. so whatever that word vomit, whatever you want to take from it, please do. <laughs> Which is to say I didn't love the book because I did, but I didn't. <laughs> I think oh, well, yeah, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that one thing that will stick with me for a long time is the discussion of inches and years of life. And I thought that was um, just an incredibly moving mm. comparison of two people's lives. That's all. Yeah, I went back and I read that again because I was like, that was just so, there was so much in there. Like the idea that, you know, Ichiro was like, I no, I, want, I would rather take the 11 inches or the eight inches or the six inches or the two inches mm. than like my 50 years of, of this, of this prison. Um, and that's just a really, that's a, that's, that's a lot to grapple with, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I felt a lot of compassion for, for the characters in this book. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that just really struck me was how much they were like how much they were willing to see other people and the fullness of themselves but not able to extend that towards themselves so compassion for other people and their perspectives but little compassion for the self and I I really saw that in in how all the other characters um, that Ichiro interacted with so many of them showed him a great deal of compassion and acceptance and he just wasn't willing to receive that and I wondered like if we were to write a book about this time period and and our our community and whatever um like what we know would we have that same expansive view to be able to write other people's thoughts or other people's experiences in this way because he does he delves into so many different perspectives with a great deal of compassion 
and I wonder, um, I, I truly wondered, I was like, could I, could I hold someone else's perspective that is probably going to be different from mine, but could I hold that um, with the same level of detail and understanding as he did? That's a really interesting question. That's, <laughs> I mean, no, really, because it, it's just, yeah. thinking about that it's like yeah right now especially I, you know yeah I think we could benefit from it oh, oh yeah I think it would yeah. even be a good exercise to 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 try yeah um see how far you got <laughs> <laughs> wow okay yeah that's kind of an Oprah moment of like <laughs> whoa maybe the people in life who uh, I don't know to, I didn't see Ichiro as the most compassionate character, but more than anything, he was feeling compassion for people. And his ability to observe and notice mm -hmm. is really just an ability to, is a capacity for compassion. Yeah. I'll be thinking about it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> he even finds compassion for his mother at the end. Yes. Even, you know, maybe still hating her but, oh my God, do you remember the, the paragraph where he says, you know, if I had only stopped my mother and said, who is your favorite teacher in school? Tell me right now. And it was a, a, a very rapid fire series of questions of things he wanted to ask his own mother yeah. that he never did. And... You know, I, I, that's a very compassionate moment where he's thinking this was a real person with real thoughts and live, a life and memories and feelings and not just this mean old woman who made his life miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I want to thank you all for giving us space to talk about another book like this. I'm always so, so happy with these discussions, and I'm glad that um, we, we continue to have them. Next month, we are reading a horror story because it is Halloween season. Uh, we're reading My Sweet Girl by Amanda Jayatisa, and um, it, we will also be interviewing the author on Instagram live so that I hope that you will all be able to join us um, or at least view the recording afterwards. So I'm very excited about this next read. Yeah, that will be, that'll be fun. Um, yeah. And thank you again. And as Christopher <laughs> said at the beginning, but just for putting in our hands, another really great book and for, um, you know, leading us in this discussion about it. So thank you. Yeah. It's very appreciated. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you all so much. All mm -hmm. right. Take care. Bye.